Please get out your King James Bibles and turn to the book of Malachi. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament, the Minor Prophets, called Minor Prophets because, not because of their importance of the message, but rather their size. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Malachi is an interesting book. And we're going to go to chapter number four. It's basically a one or two. One large paragraph or two small ones. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly, shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes, ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Huh, pretty interesting if you ask me. So let's read this and go through it and break it down. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. And all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. For the day of the Lord, for the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. All right, so let's read 2 Peter chapter 3 again, verse 10. I know I've covered a lot of this stuff in the previous chapters, but, you know, that's how you learn things, going through something two, three, four, five times. And then this way, when people tell you that the day of Christ and the day of the Lord is two different events, well, you'll have ammunition to either prove them right or prove them wrong. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. For the unbelievers, right? Because they're not going to be looking for the Lord. In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Do you know that not only the wicked's works are going to be work, uh, burnt up, but some of the unright, well, some of the unfruitful works of the righteous are going to be burned up also. I guess I'll have to prove that, but uh, all right, let's keep reading. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, 
Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, where in the heavens, being on fire, fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. All right, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Corinth was a city in Greece, and this is Paul writing this. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, and carnal has reference to the flesh, right? For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while, for while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. That's very important. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. We're not saved by our works. Works are proof of your salvation. What you do will be reflected by what you believe. For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. Do you know our bodies are God's building? Wow. Verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it. What day? The day of the Lord, right? For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Ooh. You see, the wicked's works are going to be all be burned up along with them. But our unfruitful works of those that are saved, we're going to suffer the loss of the unfruitful works. But, you know, it says, if any man's work shall be burned, 
he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So, I guess we ought to read the rest. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Vain means worthless. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All are yours, and ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. All right, back to Malachi 4, verse 2. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes, ashes, under the soles of your feet the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Now I did an entire study on the parable of the wheat and the tares, but we're going to read Matthew chapter 23, starting in verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, He is Christ, right? The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares, or weeds, and sowed tares among the wheat, and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares. Hmm. Gather ye first the tares. Bind them in bundles to burn them. Burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. You know, this, this parable right here totally destroys the pre-trib rapture. Gather ye together first the tares, the weeds, and bind them into bundles to burn them. But gather the weed into my barn. So, let's go to verse 36. You know, the disciples are like, what in the heck was he talking about there, you know? All right, uh, let's see. Let's go to verse 34. All of these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came with him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. In other words, explain this to us. We, we don't get it. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, 
but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned, burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun. Did we just read that about the sun in Malachi? Yeah, we did. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Interesting. Now let's look at Malachi 4, verse 2 again. But unto you that fear my name shall the sun, S-U-N, just like in the uh, what we just read, shall the sun of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of a stall. Hmm. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. All right, let's go to the book of Daniel, chapter 3. Daniel was a prince of the tribe of Judah. He was taken into captivity by King Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians, when God brought his judgment upon Judah for their wickedness. See, God always has his remnant. And David is the account of his dealings with the king of Babylon. And let's face it, there was a few faithful in, in Judah, but not many. So the, Judah was taken, Jerusalem was taken captivity, and they were there for 70 years, and then they were released by the Medes and the Persians, and uh, they were they returned to Jerusalem and rebuilt it. You could read about that in the book of Ezra, you could read about it in the book of Nehemiah. And for those of you that don't know who the Persians were that released Judah, the modern-day descendants are the Iranians. You would think if the Israelis were really true Judah, they would have a warm place in their heart for the Iranians, but they don't. Read Revelation 2.9 if you don't know what I'm talking about. All right, Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, an image of it's another word for idol, whose height was three score cubits. What is three score? A score is 20. What's three score? 60. Whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. So this, the height is 60 and the breadth is six. 66, right? Six. A lot of sixes here, huh? He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. The Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the province were gathered together under the de dedication, dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then an herald cried aloud, what's a herald? Uh, he was like a, a messenger, like a 
public, the public speaker, the guy, the master of ceremonies. Then an herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Mm. So if you don't worship the image of the, the beast, the Babylonians, you know, people should be reading this stuff. This is this is ties in with Revelation so much, and people don't they don't get it. Well, they don't get it because they won't bother to read the Bible, and then they turn on their television and watch the TV preachers, which I wonder where they're going to be on the Day of Judgment. Okay. Let's see. All right. So, therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. The image, the image of the beast, right? Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans, Chaldean was... A, um, they were Babylonians, just another name for Babylonians. You know, you could you could say, well, you know, the Texans or the New Yorkers. You know, uh, the Babylonians is like, you know, they're all they're all Babylonians. It's, it's like a Texan is an American, but not all Americans are Texans. So you know, the Chaldeans were part of the Babylonian Empire. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso, and whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast in the midst of a fiery furnace, a burning fiery furnace. Verse 12, there are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who, who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so... Our God, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Oh yeah, God's able to deliver them. They knew that. But they didn't know if he was going to do it in this specific interest. But they knew that in the end, even if their physical bodies died, that God 
would preserve them, their soul and spirit. Verse 19. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. And these men were bound in their coats, their hosen and their hats, and their other garments were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and rose up in haste and spake, and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Do you know the modern Bible versions take this and say, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of the Gods, plural. But the King James says, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. The Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning, fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. You know what's interesting? A lot of people don't know it, but do you know that Nebuchadnezzar wrote by, I'm assuming, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? He wrote part of the book of Daniel. Did you know that? Nebuchadnezzar wrote part of the book of Daniel. I, I, you have to wonder, did Nebuchadnezzar get saved? Evidently. And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselor being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power. The fire had no power, nor was an hair of their hen, head singed. Neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. The fire, the fire, when the earth is destroyed with fire, the fire will have no power over God's children. Zero. These men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was an hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their house, houses shall be made a dunghill. <laughs> you know what a dunghill is? It's a pile of uh, S-H, you get it, yeah. You ever heard the expression, no, that's a pile of, never mind. Because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort, then the king promoted then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. See, the Chaldeans tried to have them destroyed, but instead they got promoted. Now, those of you that think I'm not, uh, Nebuchadnezzar didn't 
write the book of Daniel. Turn, to Dan turn the page. Go to Daniel chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar the king, unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in, the, in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I, who's I? Nebuchadnezzar. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house and flourishing in my palace. You know, and then you could keep reading if you want, but I just wanted to prove that what I told you was true. All right, let's go back to Malachi chapter 4. Let's see. All right, so in verse 4 he said, Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. And then it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. I did an hour and 40 minute study on Elijah the prophet. Matter of fact, it took, before I went to sleep, it took all night till the next morning for it to process. I mean, uh, an hour and 40 minute study takes a long time to process. Even on a um, fast computer, it takes a long time. See, I have to take audio. I'm doing an audio file right now. But then I have to convert it to a video type file to be able to post it to YouTube. And it takes time to convert. So, an hour and 40 minute Bible study on Elijah. I go through pretty much the whole thing. So, Elijah the prophet will come before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, I want to leave you thinking for a second. There were some that said, you know, they say that John the Baptist was Elijah the prophet, or they call him Elias. That's the Greek rendering of the Hebrew word Elijah. But the thing is, when Christ, re when Christ came to earth and was preaching the gospel, was that the coming of the great dreadful day of the Lord? No. No, it was a day of good tidings. It was a, a, a day of, you know, the, the beginning of the redemption of Israel. It's not the coming of the great dreadful day of the Lord. And then there's people that will try to trick you and make you think that John the Baptist was the coming of the prophet Elijah. So I guess when Christ preached on the earth, it was the great and dreadful day of the Lord, right? No. Wrong. See, the devil's smart, and he's got a lot of children. A lot of children. And they run Bible colleges, and they preach on TV, and they have jobs as preachers and churches. Me? Hey, it's just me. Um, I don't get paid for what I do here. And like I've said in the past, you know, you get what you pay for. I do this, Jesus said, freely ye have received, freely give. And that's what I'm doing. I'm freely giving. So take it with a grain of salt. Am I always right? No, absolutely not. But I'll try I try to be right. I don't try to deceive anybody. And I believe the King James Bible from Genesis 1 1 to Revelation 22. All right, so let's take a look. We're going to take a look at this is the um, this is the last book in the Old Testament. We're going to be going to the New Testament and looking at the day of the day of the Lord, day of Christ. But before uh, this, so let's take a look 
at John the Baptist and Elijah the prophet. Let's take a look. All right, turn your Bibles to the New Testament. We're going to go to the book of Luke, chapter 1. And we're going to start in verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias. Now, if he was a priest, he was a Levite. Levi was the tribe of the priests that were to serve the Lord in the temple and the tabernacle. That was the intention of the tithe. You see, 11 of the tribes were given portions of land in Israel. But the tribe of Levi was not given a portion of the land. That was the purpose of the tithe. So when you hear your TV preacher saying, will you rob God and you got to pay the tithe? Ask them to prove their genealogy that they're of the tribe of Levi. You see, it's not wrong to give money to those that are serving God, but it's not a tithe unless they're of the tribe of Levi. So if they can't prove that they're a, 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 of the tribe of Levi, of, the, of Israel, it's not a tithe. It's a lie. You can give an offering. Offering's fine. But that's, that's the name of that tune. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, of the course of Abbei, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron. Uh, Aaron was Moses' brother. He was of the tribe of Levi. Okay, so evidently, not only was Zacharias of the tribe of Levi, he married a, a wife of the tribe of Levi. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. That's what you call holy smoke. That's a joke, people. I know. Don't quit my day job. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. I think I'd be pretty bothered too, you know. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. You know, I believe the Bible. When it says, and thou shalt call his name John, I believe that's what the angel said. I don't know what the Talmudic uh, Yiddish-speaking Chazars would try to make us believe his name was, but I believe his name was John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many, many, not all, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. See, that was the um, uh, Samson. He took a, the vow. I uh, was a Naz was a Nazarite vow not to drink. You know, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Wow. He was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. 
think about that the next time they tell you that abortion of a fetus is not killing a, a person. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Listen carefully. And he, who, John, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. That's Elijah. Let's read this again. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias and turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's what John did. He baptized in the river Jordan to prepare people for Christ. Read your Bibles, people. And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. And, I mean, he's not, he's like, he's not just questioning. I mean, he's like saying, this is impossible. My wife is old. She's, she's past menopause. And, and me, I, you know, forget about it. It's not going to happen. I mean, that's, that's what he's basically saying here. He's, you know, there's a difference between, you know, saying, asking, how is this going to come to pass? I would like to know. There's a difference between believing what the angel says and asking how is it going to happen to saying what you're saying is impossible i'm old my wife's old she can't have children anymore are you nuts verse 19 and the angel answering said to him i am gabriel that stand in the presence of god and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings and behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. For he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. And then... Well, I guess we may as well just keep reading, right? And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel, same angel, was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And David was of the tribe of Judah, not of Levi. Ju Judah was the tribe of the kings. To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that, are, that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast her in her mind, What manner of salutation that uh, this should be? In other words, what kind of a greeting is this? And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yeshua HaMashiach. No. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, 
and shall call his name Jesus. And let me tell you something, people. Do you know what the common language of this area was in the time? It was Greek. If you didn't know Greek, you could not conduct standard business. There used to be a time, if you didn't speak English in the United States, that you could not conduct business. Now, when you go to Miami, when you go to Los Angeles, if you don't know Spanish, most many companies won't even hire you. Oh, yeah, you got to speak Spanish. But, during this time period, Greek was the common language of the area. And let's face it, the Jews spent 70 years in Babylon. I mean, let's face it, there's probably a lot of them that, you know, they, they had to learn Babylonian. They probably, except for the scholars, they pro maybe they didn't even know Hebrew. I don't know. But if you had to deal with the Roman government, you had to converse in Latin or hire somebody that could. But Greek was the, co the language of the common man in the area because the Greeks under Alexander the Great had conquered the entire, that whole area. Alexander the Great had conquered basically from India all the way to um, past Egypt and the Mediterranean. He conquered that whole area. And guess what? When you get conquered, you're going to learn the conqueror's language. That's, what, that's how it works. And the New Testament was written in Greek. So when the Bible, when my English Bible says, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus, I believe it. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob. Jacob's name was changed for Israel, 12 tribes. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? She didn't say, oh, this is impossible, because I, I haven't known a man. She asked, how, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? She was basically saying, okay, I, I can believe this, but how, how is this going to happen? There was a difference between her and Zacharias. How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing, that holy thing which shall be born of thee, shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill, into the hill country with haste, into a city of Judah, and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. Now listen to this. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. The babe leaped in her womb, jumped for joy. Elizabeth's baby, John the Baptist, leaped for joy in her womb. Think about that. Yeah, abortion's just killing a fetus, right? 
And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden, for behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed great strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent away empty. He hath holpen his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed, forever. And Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. Now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, and she brought forth a son. And her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord hath showed great mercy unto her, and they rejoiced with her. And it came to pass that on the eighth day there came they came to circumcise the son. And they called him Zacharias, after the name of his father. And his mother answered and said, Not so, but he shall be called John. And they said unto her, There is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. And they made signs to his father how he would have him called. And he asked for a writing table and wrote, saying, His name is John. And they marveled all. And his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue loosed, and he spake and praised God. And fear came on all that dwelt round about them, and all these sayings were noised abroad throughout the hill, all the hill country of Judea. And all that heard them laid up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. He, as he spoke, Spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we be delivered, that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go forth before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. To go forth before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace and the child and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. All right, let's read verse 17 again. And he, John, and he shall go 
before him in the spirit and power, in the spirit and power of Elias, Elijah. So he's going to be in the spirit and power of Elias. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. All right, let's go to John, the book of John, chapter 1. All right, let's go. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He, John, he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, now it's speaking about Christ. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Now, i got to make a statement here. Anytime you read sons of God in the Old Testament, it refers to angels. But in the New Testament, but as many as received him, only those that received Christ, but as many as received him, to them he gave he power to, to become sons of God even to them that believe on his name. Now, if you don't believe in Genesis 6 that the sons of God are angels, may I suggest you read Job chapter 38. The sons of God shouted for joy at the foundation of the earth. Six days after the foundation of the earth, Adam was formed of the dust of the earth. Therefore, the sons of God had to exist before the earth was created. The earth was created, and then six days later, Adam came. Now, Adam was a son of God. After all, who was his father and who was his mother? Think about that. But Seth and Abraham and Moses and all the rest were not sons of God until they get the power of Christ. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh. That's right, God was made flesh. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of Him and cried, saying, This was He of whom I spake, He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for He was before me. Now wait a minute. Elizabeth was six months old, I mean, with child six months before uh, Mary conceived of the Holy Ghost. So, he that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me? How could, if John was six months older than Christ, how could Christ be before him? Simple. He was God the Son, the Son of God. Verse 16, and of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came 
by Jesus Christ. I tell you what, let the Torah keepers, let them have their law of Moses. I prefer grace and truth by Jesus Christ. And I'm not sure I know who Yeshua HaMashiach is. But I know who Jesus Christ is. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? They're asking him, Are you Elijah? What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. And there's people that will tell you that John the Baptist was reincarnated Elijah or Elias. I think John knew who he was. They asked him, Are you Elias? And he said, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. So he's, John the Baptist was not Elias or Elijah. But we did read where he came in the spirit and the power of Elias, right? We read that. Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? He said, John, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Esaias. Now, Elias is Elijah, and Esaias is the Greek rendering for Isaiah. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Esaias. And they which were sent of the Pharisees, and they asked him, and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias? neither that prophet. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is, whose coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh man, which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come, baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, and he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Again the next day, after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. All right, let's go to Matthew chapter 17. Okay, Jesus is going to be telling us a few things here. Matthew 17, verse 1. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter and James and John his brother and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun and his raiment, his clothing, and his raiment was white as the light. 
And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with them. So here it is, you got Moses, the law, and Elijah, or Elias, the prophet. This represents the law and the prophets appearing unto Christ. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must come first? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall come first and restore all things. So Elijah, just like it said in Malachi, Elijah's going to come. Elias, Elijah, truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Didn't we just read that John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elias, Elijah the prophet? Oh yeah. All right, back to Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day, before the coming of the great dreadful dreadful day of the Lord. Now, when Christ came, it wasn't the great dreadful day of the Lord. It was a day of good tidings, people. And he, Elijah, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest they come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 19 and verse 15, one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin. In any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witness, witnesses, shall the matter be established. So if somebody committed a crime, you had to have two or three witnesses that, that witnessed it. Witnesses, right? And let me tell you something. Perjury in the Old Testament was if you witnessed falsely against somebody to have them put to death for a crime, and they found out you were lying, you died you died. You got the same penalty that they did. Deuteronomy 17, verse 6. We just read uh, Deuteronomy 19, 15, but now we're going to read Deuteronomy 17, 6. At the mouth of two witnesses or three witness, witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, but at the mouth of one witness, witness he shall not be put to death. Okay. Turn to Revelation chapter 11. We're going to read the following. You have the two witnesses. And I believe one of them is going to be Elias or Elijah. Verse 1. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Arise, and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall be tread down underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power 
unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. A thousand two hundred and threescore days is basically the same as forty in two months. It's three and a half years. And I will give power unto my two witnesses that they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. That's what Elijah did in the Old Testament. He, it didn't rain in Israel for, I think it was like three years. I think it was three years. Didn't rain. Can you imagine not having any rain for three years? Uh, no crops for three years? Wow. Uh, you know, the Bible is written for an example unto us. If you know that it wasn't going to rain for three years and there wasn't going to be any food grown, uh, wouldn't you make preparations? The pre-trib rapture people aren't going to make any preparations. Zero. Absolutely no preparations at all. Matter of fact, they tell they tell people that do make preparations, they call them, they say, oh, well, you don't have any faith in God. What? Believing what the Bible says means we don't have faith in God? Really? You know, Joseph was warned in a dream that there was going to be famine for seven years. What did he do? He prepared. The pre-trib rapture people say, oh, well, you don't have any faith in God. God will provide. Yeah, he did. He warned you. He gave you a warning. All right, verse 7. And when they, the two witnesses, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. It's funny. Everybody will say, this is Rome. The great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So, I guess their Messiah, I don't know what his name is, I guess their Messiah was crucified in Rome. But, I don't know about you, but my Messiah, Christ, Jesus, was crucified in Jerusalem, not in Rome. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and in half, and shall not suffer or allow their bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. See, God has his remnant. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the seventh angel, the seventh trump. And there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever 
and ever. Wow. All right, verse 16. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God. You know, I kind of think that these four and twenty elders, I'm just throwing this out there. I think that's the, um, the twelve tribes of Israel and the twelve apostles, not Judas, Paul. But that's just my opinion. And if you don't believe me, that's fine. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings, and an earthquake and great hail. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 21 and close this study out. Verse 1, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Why? Because there was a fire, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto them that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. All right, this is the end of this study. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen.